In the early hours of June 20, 1837, Victoria received a call from the Archbishop of Canterbury, and the Lord Chamberlain and learned of the death of William IV, third son of George III. Later that morning the Privy Council, was impressed by the graceful assurance of the new Queen's demeanour. She was small, carried herself well, and had a delightful silvery voice, which she retained all her life. The accession of a young woman was romantically popular. But because of the existence in Hanover of the Salic Law, which prevented succession by a woman, the crowns of Great Britain and Hanover became separated, the latter passing to William IV's eldest surviving brother, Ernest, the unpopular Duke of Cumberland. The Queen, who had never before had a room to herself, exiled her mother to a distant set of apartments when they moved into Buckingham Palace. Conroy was pensioned off. Only Leeson, of whom Victoria was still in awe, remained close to the Queen. Even her beloved uncle Leopold was politely warned off discussions of British politics. Alone at last, she enjoyed her newfound freedom. Victoria, wrote her cousin Prince Albert, who later married her. Is said to be incredibly stubborn in her extreme obstinacy to be constantly at war with her good nature, she delights in court ceremonies, etiquette and trivial formalities, she is said not to take the slightest pleasure in nature and to enjoy sitting up at night and sleeping late into the day. It was, in retrospect, the least sensible and satisfactory time in her whole life, but at the time it was exciting and enjoyable, the more so because of her romantic friendship with Lord Melbourne, the Prime Minister. Melbourne was a crucial influence on Victoria, in many ways an unfortunate one. The urbane and sophisticated Prime Minister fostered the new Queen's self-confidence and enthusiasm for her role, he also encouraged her to ignore or minimize social problems and to attribute all discontent and unrest to the activities of a small group of agitators. Moreover, because of Melbourne, Victoria became an ardent Whig. Victoria's constitutionally dangerous political partisanship contributed to the first two crises of her reign, both of which broke in 1839. The Hastings affair began when Lady Flora Hastings, a maid of honor who was allied and connected to the Tories, was forced by Victoria to undergo a medical examination for suspected pregnancy. The gossip, when it was discovered that the Queen had been mistaken, became the more damaging when later in the year Lady Flora died of a disease that had not been diagnosed by the examining physician. The enthusiasm of the populace over the coronation, June 28, 1838, swiftly dissipated. Between the two phases of the Hastings case the bedchamber crisis intervened. When Melbourne resigned in May 1839, Sir Robert Peel, the Conservative leader, stipulated that the Whig ladies of the bedchamber should be removed. The Queen imperiously refused, not without Melbourne's encouragement. The Queen of England will not submit to such trickery, she said. Peel therefore declined to take office, which Melbourne rather weakly resumed. I was very young then, wrote the Queen long afterward, and perhaps I should act differently if it was all to be done again.